Uuu, Zara. 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 Please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, let's go back. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session uh, of the second day of the Darmetar workshop. It is a pleasure to have here uh, as a first speaker, Andre Lessa from UFBC. And he's going to talk us about testing minimal FIMP models uh, at the LEC. So, Andre, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you a lot for the invitation. It has been a very nice workshop so far. Uh, I think it's... It's good that I'm talking now because we've heard a, a lot about direct detection and, and WIMPs this morning. So I'll try to convince you that the LHC is a very useful probe to test FIMP mod models to become clear to the end of my talk. So the, the key word here, are you guys hearing me? OK, OK. So the key word here is minimal. So let me first tell you what I want, what I mean by minimal. So I'm trying to construct or discuss minimal dark, mo dark matter models, where minimal I mean a minimal particle content, and I will restrict here to dimension four or less operators. So no effective operators, no uh, higher dimensional operators uh, here. And we have some. Uh, very simple options. The first one is just to add a singlet to the standard model, famous Higgs portal dark matter. Then we can add a multiplet, it's called minimal dark, mod, dark matter. And the next step is add a singlet and a BSM mediator. So the mediator here is not in the standard model. And for these minimal scenarios, I want to discuss like which which of these are still viable, and which of these can be tested at the LHC, or there is hope to, to see at the LHC. So if we restrict to the WIMP um, mechanism, the, the WIMP framework, we know and we've heard this morning that these scenarios are highly constrained by direct detection. Right? So typically, the WIMP has uh, electroic-like couplings, and this gives you high enough annihilation, uh, high enough scattering cross-sections, and direct detection puts strong constraints on these minimal scenarios. Of course, you can always go to non-minimal non cases, and then you can avoid some of these constraints. And basically, in a very broad stroke, the direct detection experiments push you either to a high mass WIMP, so above 500 GV or so, or in some special cases to resonant regions and so on, like in the Higgs portal case. Right? So this is just to motivate why I'm going to talk about FIMPs. Right? So in the WIMP framework, basically, all the region that survives direct detection is very hard to test at the LHC. And I show that for FIMPs, the picture is reversed. And so FIMPs can easily evade the direct detection constraints, and the LHC can be very sensitive to these models. So just a quick reminder, what's the freezing mechanism? So the idea is that dark matter has super tiny interactions with the standard model or some other particle that's um, thermalized with the thermal bath in the early universe. So in the early universe, the production mechanism for dark matter is two to two, two scatterings or decays of uh, thermal particles. And the, the big point here is that these couplings are so suppressed that this only happens in one direction. They, uh, number density of dark matter is never thermal, it never thermalizes, so the inverse process is suppressed. And the idea is that as the universe evolves, so this is okay, 1 over t, basically in this axis, okay, this plot is hard to see, but time is going this way, so as the universe evolves, these processes inject dark matter slowly, till they become inefficient and we, we say that dark matter freezes in. Right? The usual freeze-out picture is dark matter is in thermal uh, equilibrium with the other particles. So if this coupling is not too small, it will thermalize, and then it will 
decouple and freeze out. So the, the picture here is sort of the opposite of freeze out for. In the freezing, if you increase this coupling, you produce more dark matter initially. So increasing the, cu the coupling increases the abundance, while in freeze out, increasing the coupling decreases the abundance. This, of course, relies on two very important assumptions. First, we start with zero dark matter and, uh, number density after reheating. This is a strong assumption. Not always well justified, but typically it's what's it's assumed. And it relies on very small coupling. So your dark matter standard model or dark matter thermal bath couplings have to be of the order of 10 to the minus 10. Okay, so super tiny couplings. We're really talking about very, very small couplings here. So let's try to construct minimal models that can implement this freezing mechanism. Right? So the first case is just add a scalar singlet to the standard model, the usual Higgs portal coupling. And for the freezing mechanism to work, this coupling here, here, I'll call this the freezing coupling, has to be super small, right? 10 to the minus 10. So if we want to look at these models at the LHC, we can have processes like this, Higgs going to two dark matter particles. But this coupling is tiny, tiny, right? 10 to the minus 10. So there is no visible signature at LHC. So even though this is the simplest case, we cannot really test it at the LHC, unless, of course, we add stuff to the model. The next minimal thing could be, OK, what if my dark, matter, my dark matter is not a singlet, it's a multiplet. But if it's a multiplet, then we cannot have such tiny couplings, right? It will, the quantum numbers will automatically give you some gauge couplings. So it's very hard to have a multiplet thing. So typically, we're restricted to singlet dark matter. The next step, OK, I'll get single dark matter, and I'll add, I'll add a mediator, a BSM mediator. So we can classify bas basically in two uh, big groups. One where we have an S-channel mediator. So this is a BSM particle. can be a vector, or the spins here are not really important at this point. So if I have a mediator like this, this is the freezing coupling. This has to be super small, 10 to the minus 10. So again, this is very hard to see at the LHC. Right? The mediator, of course, will decay back to the standard model. So you can search for it, like V going to QQ. But this doesn't give you any connection to dark matter. Right? You are basically looking for a resonance, and you have no clue if it's connected to dark matter or not, because this branching ratio is super suppressed. The next possibility is to have a T-channel mediator, some process like this. Right? And this would be the freezing coupling. It has to be super small. So again, we could, at first sight, say, OK, this is also very, very hard to see. We have two freezing couplings here. This is just the amplitude goes as 10 to the minus 20. No chance of seeing it. But if we look carefully, we see that this mediator has to have standard model quantum numbers, because this is a singlet. So this helps us a lot, because then we can directly produce this mediator like in a process such like this. Right? And then the mediator will decay back to a standard model plus dark matter. Okay? So this is the focus of this talk. Look at this process and see if it can be seen at the LHC, what's the connection with the relic density, and how, what type of searches at the LHC are sensitive to this type of process. So just to be specific, we'll consider, uh, yeah. No, OK, yeah. So I will, I will show the Lagrangian in a second, but the, the point is there is sort of a Z2 type symmetry here. This is the only decay channel for F. So the branching ratio is 1. Okay. In, this, in the minimal case, the branching ratio is 1. So I'll call this type of scenario an LHC-friendly model. 
So just to be specific, I'll assume I scale a dark matter and a spin one half mediator, a fermion mediator. And I also assume that this fermion mediator is an SU2 left singlet. Okay. There is another work where they consider a doublet here, or just consider the singlet, which is the, the simplest case. And then we have two options for can be a lepton-like mediator, so basically a heavy lepton, vector-like lepton, or a vec uh, quark uh, can have quark-like quantum numbers. So I call this the leptonic model, and this the hadronic model. So effectively, in this case, F w works as a heavy lepton, and here as a heavy quark. Okay. So this is the Lagrangian for this minimal scenario. Right, so we have the scalar here, the usual couplings, and then we have this vector like f. And this is the FIMP coupling. So I have dark matter, f, and one of the fields of the standard model. Right. So depending on the quantum numbers of f, this will fix which standard model fermion I'll have here. Right. So for the leptonic model where f is like a heavy lepton, this has to be a lepton. And for the hadronic model, this will be a quark. So we have two types of models, two classes of models that I will present results for. And this is the FIMP coupling, the freezing coupling that has to be super tiny. And, and just to be uh, concrete, we will assume this coupling here is zero. So the freezing really comes from this process. And so just to be orthogonal to the Higgs portal case that I discussed initially. right? I will, I will show in a minute, but F will be of order of few hundred GV, and S will be fairly light, GV-ish, or below. Okay. So the main process I'm interested in here is something like this. Right? So this is, I'm looking for signatures at the LHC, so I can start with quarks here or gluons. I put quarks just to be specific, and then... Um, this F can be produced in a Drellian type of process if it's lepton-like, or I can have a gluon here, for instance, if it's uh, quark-like. Right? So I'll have large cross-sections for pair production of this mediator, a QCD-like or electric-like cross-sections. There is a single decay channel for this mediator, so it will be heavier than dark matter. So it will decay to dark matter and a lepton if it in the leptonic case, or dark matter and a quark in the hadronic case. So there is a single decay channel. As I said before, this has 100% branching ratio. Right? And this coupling is what controls the relic density for dark matter. This is the freezing coupling. So the relic density roughly goes as lambda square, the mass of dark matter over the mass of the mediator. So to, to get the right relic density, this has to be a tiny number. Right? I didn't put, this is, didn't put the whole expression here, but this ratio has to be small, so ms has to be much lighter than mf, or n or lambda has to be super tiny. Right? order of 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10. So the main conclusion here is that lambda is super small to get the right relic abundance. This is the freezing mechanism. But also, this lambda, the same lambda, controls the lifetime of f, of this mediator. Right? So if the lifetime of f goes as 1 over lambda square, mf, if lambda is super small, this lifetime is large. Right? So the main Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's five minutes? Okay. Sorry, speed up. <laughs> so the main conclusion here is that to get the right radical abundance, this mediator has to be long-lived. Okay, this is the the core point of this this discussion, right? So just to get an idea, here I'm considering a mediator of a few hundred GV up to two TV, and the lifetime times C, so it's a convenient way to to measure the lifetime, is of order of centimeters up to thousands of kilometers. Right? So once this F is produced at the LHC, it will propagate and decay somewhere either outside the detector or inside the detector. Right? And from now on, I will switch and I'll talk only about lifetime, but lifetime, I'm just replacing lambda square by lifetime. 
It's a one-to-one -one mapping. So I can have several possible signatures here. I'm not, I'm going to, this is just a summary of possible signatures. I'm going to discuss the main ones now since I'm running out of time, right? So this is a picture of the CMS detector. Could be Atlas, I just picked CMS to be specific. This is the tracker, the calorimeters, the muon chambers. And I'll go through some of the searches that CMS and Atlas did that apply to this scenario. They are not targeted to FIMPs, but can be used to constrain this FIMP scenario. So the first one is a displaced E plus mu search. So they look for some charged particle that decays to leptons, and then they look at this displaced lepton. Okay. This is actually a search for stops in an RPV scenario, like right? a SUSY scenario. But we can recast this search for this model, and we get constraints of this order here. This region here is excluded by this type of search. Right? So these curves here, I should have mentioned, these are curves where the relic density is 0.12 for different masses of dark matter, of S. And so here, we just exclude this small portion of the parameter space. The next search that can be sort of applied, all these are not targeted to FIMPs, to this scenario, so we have to work around it. So in this case, they are looking for compressed charginos, so it's a charger track that disappears in the middle of the detector. So in our case, we have a lepton, but this lepton may be missed because it's displaced. So if we apply constraints from this search, we exclude this region here. So slightly higher lifetimes. And then finally, we have simply searches for charger tracks. And this is very convenient for us. So if our mediator goes decays after the tracker, so in the calorimeter, or outside the detector, we can apply this search, which actually is a search for long-lived stalls. Right? And this is sort of the mo most powerful search because it excludes all this big region here. And this line just goes straight up. Right? So if I have larger lifetimes, all this part here is excluded. So this, is for the, this was for the leptonic model. In the hadronic model, I have basically the same, but my mediator decays to quarks instead of lepton. So all the leptonic searches I cannot apply. So there is a, a nice search by Atlas for displaced jets plus missing energy. It's actually a search for gluinos. And we can apply to this scenario and exclude this whole bunch of parameter space. Of course, here I have QCD cross-sections for the pair production of F, so it's very easy to exclude it. I mean, the exclusion goes further than in the leptonic case. And then, again, I can look for charged tracks. And so if this F has color, it will hadronize, and it might hadronize into a heavy heart hadron, like our hadron. And this can have electric charge. So you can also look for constraints from charged tracks. And these constraints uh, exclude this whole region of parameter space. So we can exclude a big fraction here. There's still some gaps. In the leptonic case, it's slightly worse. But we can exclude a big chunk of the parameter space using these searches, which are not meant for FIMPs, but we can adapt them and recast for these scenarios. So OK, just in time. My conclusions, like FIMPs, are a compelling alternative to the WIMP scenario. In these minimal models, there is this really nice connection between the lifetime of the mediator and the relic density. So if you can measure this lifetime, you have a direct uh, window to the relic density at least if you assume this minimal setup. Long-lived searches at the LHC are the way to test these scenarios. Right? Direct detection has no hope of seeing, OK, except that there are caveats. But in most cases, direct detection won't see these models. The LHC searches so far have not considered this model specifically. So all the searches that they've made are for other scenarios. So there are still gaps and improvements that can be made in these searches. We've also studied the high luminosity LHC and made projections on how far it goes. We can exclude a big chunk of the parameter space. 
And finally, if we see a signal there, we can have, like, we can sort of, with some hope, we can measure this freezing coupling and directly check if you get the right relic density or not. So it's a very straightforward connection between the lifetime of the mediator and the relic density. And this can be tested at the LHC. Thank you. Thanks, André. Questions? Sorry, I, it could be that I missed in the beginning when you had the uh, uh, when you had the time asymmetry. So this is a very CP violating interaction, like possibly massive CP violating interaction or not? Um, I don't think so because this is this is a vector like guy. I don't think it's it has necessarily a large CP phase. I don't think so. Well, it's time as if it's time asymmetric. The CPT theorem. Why is time asymmetric? Oh, it's out of chemical equilibrium. Okay, sorry, I misunderstood. Ah, yeah. Okay, you're talking about the first. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so so I, I think it's uh, of course very interesting that and you can have these kind of searches that have a direct connection to the small coupling for the relic density. I, I'm still wondering about the. Uh, decay branching fraction into this uh, mode because um, so you because s is a singlet so as you said uh, f uh, has the quantum numbers of some uh, standard model uh, particle and so that should mean that they will mix at some point maybe at one loop order or something and I would expect that it should inherit the decay modes of that uh, stand, say let's say it was a top right type of a uh, fermion, for example, right? And because you're competing to this very small coupling, it's not obvious to me that uh, those will not dominate. Yeah, I think, well, at least in the setup we consider, there is an explicit Z2 symmetry here. Okay, so it's, okay, S is, you can think as S as odd and F as odd. So there is a Z2 symmetry here that really, uh, guarantees that F will only decay on S. Okay. This is, um, yeah, uh, Higgsino uh, squark thing, okay? You can think of it as this way. So there is a, a Z2 symmetry here, and this will guarantee that F only decays to to dark matter plus a lepton. If, of course, I mean, S does not get a VEV and breaks the symmetry. We assume it does not. Right? So this is guaranteed. There is no, no way to mix here, I think, because of the Z2 symmetry. No, I just wanted to make a comment to, to follow up your question. There is uh, one case that I studied with uh, collaborators precisely of this framework where the S was a fermion, and it's the axino the supersymmetric partner of the axion, and the decaying particle is the axino. So if you have a spectrum where the axino, the axino is the LSP and the axino is the NLSP, then our parity ensures you that you can only have that decay channel. So there are cases where this happens. Yeah. OK. Thank you. If no more questions, so let's thank uh, Andre again. <laughs> and we can move to our next speaker, Diego Restrepo. Here. Okay. okay, so Diego will talk uh, about uh, the rough fermion dark matter with Iran neutrino masses. So, Diego, please. So, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to present this work. Um, it is based in, in several works uh, with people from Colombia and Spain mainly. 
So uh, my plan is to uh, motivate first the Lambda CDM, CDM paradigm, and from there show one example with data fermion dark matter and try to connect with neutrino masses. So, uh, as we have seen, for example, yesterday, the lambda cold dark matter paradigm is well suited to explain all the gravitational evidence of dark matter. So the idea is that uh, with the ingredients of, the, of this scenario, we can cook one universe, left it, it evolves, and at the end you, you end up with, those, with the so-called cosmic web. That is basically some points of a very high density connected with filaments, and all these connections are given through the previous uh, perturbation filled by dark matter. So, uh, in order to, to stress the importance of matter, uh, we can think, for example, in this analogy with the human body, and the dark matter is the support for all the rest. So, uh, the, the, in this analogy, the luminous matter is basically the skin, uh, the filaments are the muscles, and the, support, the, the thing that supports everything is, is the skeleton. So, for the muscle is already uh, seen in several ways, and he, he has been checked in, for example, temperature, uh, uh, recently in, in the very high end of the temperature of the gas that is uh, thinking to be along the, the filaments. And yesterday was mentioned that the, when we look into the Andromeda, uh, there is one increase in the in the uh, in the gas in the in the in the inter, intergalactic gas because of the filament. So uh, the missing ingredient is the skeleton itself, the dark matter, and we don't know anything about this, but we have a lot of possibilities. I I want to stress here the possibility that the dark matter can be a dirac fermion dark matter. And I will, before I start with the specific uh, realization, I, I will straight my notation that will be based in spinner notation to components. Uh, and uh, the scalar will always be complex scalar charts under some abelian symmetry. So uh, the, the Lagrangian for one, uh, chiral state with two degrees of freedom fermion is just written this way, um, in this simplified way, and if, if the fermion doesn't have any charge at all, it can develop one kind of Majorana mass. Uh, but, for example, one fermion uh, is one a, a special object where in this case, for example, the electric charge allows the combination of the left and the right hander parts of the well fermions, and they, they can combine into the so-called Dirac fermions. In, in the Dirac fermion then have the two components, uh, the left and right, and with this notation, the Lagrangian can be highly simplified with the well-known uh, Lagrangian. So, uh, we are here uh, uh, thinking in this possibility as a dark matter candidate. So, uh, we need uh, this uh, fermion to interact with something in order to reduce the initial thermal abundance to the current relic density. So, uh, the more straightforward way is just to introduce a vector light interaction between the fermion and one new uh, gauge bosons uh, that also interacts with the standard model fields. So, through these mechanisms, you can uh, have the usual freeze out mechanism, the wind miracle, and in principle, 
by, as you see, the two parameters, the mass of the dark matter and, and the couplings with the standard model and the uh, new fermion, you can fix the, the cosmological properties of the, of the model. So the, uh, at the end, with the current constraint from the dark matter, for example, in this simple scenario, basically uh, the only possibilities that are left uh, now for low scale dark matter is just around possible resonance with the new uh, gauge boson. Um, one specific realization in, in one a specific abelian station that is called the Biminos Isle uh, is just the usual one in which uh, the, uh, the standard model uh, is extended with three right-handed neutrinos that have this kind of lepton numbers. So the, this set, we, in, in addition with the standard model, is automatically anomaly free. And we have the uh, freedom to introduce one additional direct fermion vector light that doesn't contribute at all to the anomaly cancellation. So in this self-consistent model, you automatically uh, have all the ingredients to realize the previous model. In this case, the interaction is, is through the set prime related to with the b cell symmetry. And this scalar is uh, is the one that allows for right-handed neutrino masses and the CISO and so on and so forth. So in, in, in this kind of, of a scenario, you can have the usual CISO mechanism. And in principle, you can guarantee the stability of the fermion dark matter if you choose properly the uh, free, free chart. For example, if you assign fractional values to this chart, automatically the fermion is stable. So this is well studied in the lecture tool, for example, for Farinaldo et al. And at the end, the sorry, the is direct detection constraints uh, can be satisfied for high values of the mediator, and the gauge boson, for, sorry, high values of the dark matter mass. Uh, and a small values of the couplings. Uh, this is uh, some, something similar, but uh, in, in another recent work uh, by other people, and the result is the same. You can have a, a very huge um, possibilities to explain the dark matter content of the universe of the universe with this simple model especially for large uh, dark matter masses and small couplings. Uh, recently, we even relaxed more the uh, parameter space by allowing a second uh, fermion dark matter. And in this case, the anomaly cancellation is more tricky because the new uh, chiral states add up to plus one and also the, in the cubic card charges, so the, uh, the, uh, the, anomaly, the model is anomaly free only if the new chiral states have fractional charges, uh, and in this way they are automatically uh, stable. In this case, we need two additional scalars, and uh, basically everything is the same, but now we have two independent dark matter candidates that can share the relic abundance and relax even more the direct constraints. So uh, another way to basically to implement dark matter is by assigning color to the S to the um, Dira fermion. Uh, in addition to the U1 uh, symmetry, we can think that if that this object can have, for example, one SU3 color, especially if, if, if this one octet, like the so-called uh, Dirac Luino. So in this case, you can have the combination eight by eight, that is uh, one, one color singlet, um, because this object is neutral in color and in electric charge, in principle can be a good dark matter candidate. 
the nice feature about this model is that only one parameter, just the mass of the of the color octet. So uh, uh, making all the calculations, I will give more detail later. It is possible basically to fix the point in the parameter space where everything can be realized and institute out uh, to be a mass for the Q of, 20, of 12 and for the bound stain of 25. In this mass, uh, the relic density goes through the blue line and connect with the thermal uh, abundance in just one specific point that is a prediction that can be checked in the next few years. Uh, this work was is, is a recent work by Strumian collaborators. So uh, the idea is to put uh, the, uh, something related with uh, neutrinos that uh, also involves some directness. So uh, in principle, uh, it, there is also the possibility that the lepton number in the nature is uh, conserved uh, as a total number. We know that the neutrino masses involves violation of individual lepton number, but we still don't know if the total number is conserved or not. For example, if there is one specific signal in neutrino W beta decays experiments, this, it, this could be a signal that the violation of the total number. But until now, there is the, the conservation of the total number is one theoretical possibility. And this can be so for many years because, the, in fact, this kind of experiment, the, the, the uh, W beta decay without neutrinos is very challenging. And for example, after many, many, many years, uh, the best prospect uh, can exclude only the inverse order ordering, but will be very difficult to exclude the full parameter, especially, for example, in this kind of model where we have only two uh, massive neutrinos and one extra massless state. So we will focus in that possibility that the lepton number is a, a concerned number in the nature, and in order to, to to impose this as a very good number, we impose this as the remnant of a gauge symmetry, and we associate this gauge symmetry with the abelian symmetry uh, related to U1B minus L. So the difference with the usual uh, setup is that uh, instead of the uh, of, of some remnant uh, symmetry to be set to, we allow for larger um, discrete remanent symmetries, at least set three, for example. So uh, usually when the people talk about direct neutrino masses in, with some explanation for the smallness, because the direct, uh, di direct neutrino masses need very small couplings, uh, the idea is that the people it need to introduce uh, many, many symmetries. For, ex for example, one symmetry to avoid the three-level turn the one that is that involves the very small coping that we need to uh, explain. Uh, a second one to forbid the Majorana term, and a third one to uh, guarantee the conservation of, uh, of the total lepton number. <coughs> After impose of that kind of symmetries, the, the idea to explain the smallness on the neutrinos is to realize at least uh, a dimension phi operator that in, in this case is appears in this station of the standard model, and this operator uh, obviously conserves total lepton number. <coughs> uh, so the introduction of this gauge symmetry with the right-handed neutrinos is in some sense dangerous because uh, the interaction of the right-handed neutrinos that are relativistic with the set prime associated with the abelian symmetry uh, can thermalize in the uh, uh, early universe and generate extra relativistic de degrees of freedom that, ne that need to be checked out against the, the current bounds. So uh, the idea um, that we are pursuing now is try to combine the, the two things, the uh, direct neutrino masses and dark matter, 
Fermi, uh, Dirac Fermi Dirac Fermi matter by realizations of this kind of op operator but at one loop level. So the idea is to divide the particle content into sectors, the uh, standard model one, including the right-handed neutrinos, and a new uh, hidden sector that can circulate into the loop that generate the neutrino masses. To realize this possibility, we, we introduce uh, the original abelian symmetry to explain fermion dark matter, but uh, we also require that this symmetry uh, explain also the neutrino masses, and we need the, therefore that forbids the, all the things that need to be forbidden, and allow the thing that need to be allowed, in particular, in particular the five dimension operator and the Dirac neutrino masses, masses either directly or through a, a spontaneous symmetry breaking. And because of the constraint, it is turns that this L need to have one charge and then the, the new gauge groups, and this charge can be normalized to be, to be just the B minus L1. So, for simplicity, we just choose the one B minus L possibility. Uh, at one loop level, you have many topologies to realize. Uh, in a work in progress, we are working in all of them, but for here, I will choose the typical one, that is the central one, this one. So, the lepton number associated with the, with, with the lepton, is circulating, circulating uh, this way. The lepton number associated with the right-handed neutrino is circulating this way. So we have the freedom to choose one extra uh, free charge to accommodate the stability of the mediate or the internal particles um, in order to guarantee the existence of dark matter. At the end, the, uh, because this is the scalar that breaks down uh, the symmetry. Uh, this can be seen only as, as one effective model where this coupling appears uh, it directly in the Lagrangian and generated for the spontaneous symmetry of the U1B minus L. So after working out for one, for one neutrino mass, you can fix all the charges easily. In, and in particular, the SU3 charge can be either singlet or can, be a, or can be one octet that is good to connect with the possibility of colored dark matter. We start with this, the simple possibility, just one a color singlet, and uh, we need to satisfy anomaly cancellations. The constraints imply that the charges of the right-handed neutrinos need to be different from one, so there is a, a, this well a possibility to solve the anomalies by choosing the charges plus four, plus four, minus five, for example. And in this term, it, it is rather easy to get two ne neutrino masses, and um, one of the neutrinos remain massless. Uh, we chose this possibility, and the fermions are easy to accommodate because, because we need to introduce just as vector light, but in order to generate mm, a run two neutrino mass, we need at least two scalars, um, yeah. e, and with this we have a self-consistent model that can explain everything, the previous one and now the neutrino masses. Uh, with this final model with all the chart fixes, for example, uh, we have both uh, one loop neutrino masses and uh, the same explanation for um, for for the uh, cosmic uh, relics, in, the, in, in particular the dark matter abundance. Here it is important in addition to the LAC constraints and uh, the constraint for the new degrees of freedoms. And uh, uh, this work is, can be applied here, it's you not know, from us, because they require one extra set two, but the Lagrangian is basically the same. And know that uh, as always, uh, this kind of scenario relies, in some sense, in in, in, in solution around the resonance of the set prime. Uh, so, 
the realization itself is with uh, uh, can be a co a constrained by also the detection in the same way than before. And finally, the color that matter can be easily accommodated uh, with the specific mass. Um, maybe we can just uh, conclude here that we, in, in this specific scenario, uh, we can, in, in principle, expect for some discovery in direct detection uh, later for one discovery in colliders, but in this case, unfortunately, we will need some 100 TV colliders to discover this kind of color of that matter. Uh, my conclusion is that, uh, in principle, we can exploit both the smallness of Dirac neutrino masses and the stability of Dirac fermion dark matter without single symmetry with nothing else that is something uh, new. And this has been already applied for the case of colored that matter. So thank you. Thank you. Questions? Diego, could you realize freezing in this model? Yes, I think so. Because, for example, in one of the topologies, you can, have, you can easily have a single the scalars that can be, in principle, a common a, a definite scenario, yes. No, in this topology, but in, an, in another possibility, yeah. Something else? Okay, very good. So let's thank Diego again. So we go to the last talk of this first afternoon session. Speaker will be Giovanni Grilli. And he's going to talk us about uh, dark mesons uh, in hidden valley models. So Giovanni, please. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So I will talk uh, specifically about uh, this uh, work done in collaboration with Enrico and Hugh. Uh, I don't think uh, I have to go through these slides. Uh, we just know that uh, we, there are strong evidence, uh, evidences for dark matter uh, that mainly come from astrophysical observations, while uh, direct and indirect detection searches uh, uh, are failing to find any dark matter uh, particle. They are, however, putting very strong constraints on the couplings between uh, dark matter and uh, the standard model. And this uh, lead to some tension uh, in the wind paradigm uh, and uh, to, to the proposal of new possible mechanism. Uh, among these, uh, there are, for example, uh, strongly interacting massive particles, elastically decoupling dark matter and codecane dark matter. And uh, another possibility is the fact that uh, one can have dark matter in, uh, uh, as the light mesons of uh, hidden valley sector. Now, in the past, uh, we studied uh, these uh, light mesons in hidden valley sector uh, with all the, the mesons uh, stable. However, it's uh, not uh, so strange to think that some of these mesons can be stable and some unstable. If you think uh, if uh, the electron and the muon uh, in the standard model would have been uh, heavier than the charged pion, the charged pion would have been stable, while the neutral pion would still decay into two photons. The same would happen uh, uh, for the counts if uh, we, w we had uh, a uh, diagonal uh, CKM. So these are also motivated by the fact that uh, this model can be embedded in more complete models that solve the hierarchy problem, like, for example, Twin X or the Relaxion. And uh, our motivation for exotic signatures uh, uh, in, uh, uh, at, uh, at colliders, like uh, semi-visible jets. So semi-visible jets are simple, simple jets that have some uh, collinear uh, missing energy uh, in the same direction. And they were studied uh, first in uh, these papers here by Lisanne Tetal and uh, later by uh, Hugh, uh, Enrico, me, and uh, Zara. Uh, of course, it's uh, impossible to study all possible uh, uh, dark sectors, so one has to take some be benchmark scenario. So we took simply a dark QCD. Uh, we have uh, three uh, light uh, dark uh, uh, quarks, uh, uh, SU3 confining uh, uh, symmetry, uh, and uh, the dark quarks are uh, fundamental uh, of this symmetry. Uh, we have, of course, a confinement scale 
lambda. And uh, as in the standard model, there will be an SU3 left times SU3 light, uh, right uh, symmetry that will be spontaneously broken, broken to the SU3 vectorial. Uh, the, the, the broken sy symmetry will uh, lead to some dark mesons that can be unstable or uh, long-lived. And so we will have a sector in which we have a mediator that uh, connects the standard model with uh, this uh, new dark sector that will be uh, basically a kind of a copy of the, of the QCD. Now, this one is uh, the pion Lagrangian uh, that uh, one can get. So we, we call all the mesons pions. Uh, we have uh, uh, two pions that, uh, we, will, uh, uh, that uh, we, we call pi u because uh, they are unstable, and we have three pions that are stable. So how it is possible to get uh, stable and unstable pions? One can think that uh, there is some uh, uh, NU1 symmetry for each of the dark quarks, and therefore the pion will be charged charged under combinations of these uh, U1 symmetries, and this uh, will lead to the possibility that at least two pions uh, are uh, stable. Uh, in order to have three pions stable, it's enough that the splitting among the pions uh, is uh, small enough such that uh, a pion cannot decay into uh, other stable pions. Uh, this uh, kind of model uh, leads to the possibility to have several terms in the Lagrangian. For example, we can have this term here that contains uh, five pions, and uh, this one is the vest zumino witten term that will lead to uh, the possibility of having uh, uh, number-changing processes uh, of three uh, stable pions uh, annihilating into two stable pions. Then we can also have uh, um, terms of this kind uh, that will give rise to uh, uh, two uh, stable pions uh, annihilating in two standard model, or depending on the uh, time arrow in this, uh, in this uh, diagram, uh, we can have uh, uh, scattering of uh, stable pions on uh, standard model fields or uh, production of uh, stable pions from uh, standard model. And this, uh, of course, will give rise to uh, the usual direct detection, indirect detection, and collider constraints. Then we have also a term that uh, will allow the possibility of uh, annihil two annihilating two uh, stable pions into two unstable ones. And finally, we have that uh, the unstable pions can decay in two standard model fields uh, through this uh, operator here. Of course, uh, uh, taking into account that this Lagrangian is, uh, uh, is just a qualitative Lagrangian. Uh, here, I didn't put uh, all the terms. Uh, there are mi missing factors, and there are also other missing terms uh, that uh, I, uh, I'm not going to explain uh, right now. So, in, uh, in principle, uh, dark mesons can give rise to the correct uh, uh, abundance. For example, if we take the parameter lambda, that uh, is uh, uh, this parameter here, close to zero, we have that uh, one can get the correct abundance uh, via strongly interacting massive particle or elastic decoupling relic. That means uh, the only possibility is to have uh, a three to two mechanism, and uh, the difference between the two is. Uh, uh, depending on when uh, the um, uh, when the, the dark sector decouples uh, uh, from the standard model, as uh, lambda increases, uh, we have co-decaying uh, dark matter. So we have that uh, the uh, dark sector decouples from the standard model at a very uh, very small x, and uh, the three to two mechanism will be inefficient. Uh, with respect to the uh, annihilation of two uh, stable pions that will be our dark matter uh, to two unstable one, uh, for the simple fact that uh, they go as a, a large power of the number density. And uh, so this mechanism will be the uh, main mechanism, and the unstable pion then will uh, k each one in two uh, standard model fields. So therefore, uh, after, uh, after the, the decoupling from the standard model, uh, the number density will decrease until the uh, stable pion will, uh, um, will decouple from the unstable one. And uh, this mechanism will depend uh, on uh, how much the stable and unstable pion interact uh, among themselves and on the parameter lambda. Then, as the lambda increases even more, uh, we have uh, that uh, the, uh, the dark sector and the standard model decouple at a larger x. And uh, uh, this, uh, this mechanism is uh, fairly independent uh, on, uh, on the value of lambda. Finally, for a very large uh, um, coupling lambda, we have that uh, the dominant mechanism is the one that gives rise to the usual uh, thermal freeze-out. Now, this one is uh, a plot in which I show all the 
mechanism in the same uh, in the same figure, we have the uh, relic density with respect to the coupling lambda for uh, a fixed model fixing all the parameters. And uh, we have from left to right, uh, at small coupling, the codecaying dark matter regime. Uh, we have the coupling independent regime for uh, that goes for a couple of order of magnitude in lambda, and then we have freeze out. Now, uh, as I told you before, uh, the previous range and show also that there are possibilities of having gains from direct detection and uh, from uh, indirect detection. So direct detection, uh, you know how it works. Uh, you have uh, uh, your dark matter that can scatter on, uh, on uh, uh, quarks that are inside the nucleons, and then one can get bounds from uh, one can get bounds from xenon one ton. One has also to take into account uh, the running effects uh, that they were explained by uh, Francesco before. Uh, instead, uh, uh, more interesting may be indirect detection, because the main uh, uh, constraints from indirect detention, detection comes from uh, these ca cascade decays. You have the two uh, stable pions that uh, annihilate, give rise to two unstable ones, and the two unstable ones then they, they will decay into uh, standard model particles, that means uh, gamma rays or light, uh, uh, light fermions. And uh, these were studied in this paper here by Elo et al., and uh, uh, they take into account constraints from the CMB, uh, dwarf galaxies from Fermilat, and uh, positrons from AMS. In principle, even uh, the annihilation of two stable uh, pions into two standard model, uh, uh, two standard model particles uh, give rise to indirect detection constraints, but this one will be weaker than the one from direct detection. And uh, the constraints from direct detection will be even stronger from the constraints uh, from uh, self-interacting dark matter. The final thing that one has to take into account uh, is uh, simply the fact that uh, we have to take care that our unstable pions decay before BBN in order to not uh, give problems during uh, uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And this is uh, done simply requiring that uh, the unstable pions decay before 0.1 seconds. However, these constraints are uh, also weaker than the one from uh, indirect detection. Now I can start uh, to show some benchmark model. Uh, this uh, will be a very simplified uh, toy model, and uh, they, they, it will be useful to understand uh, all the various mechanisms, how they work. So we will simply add to the standard model an operator like this, where we have a, a scalar mediator. We have uh, three uh, dark quarks, uh, and they couple with the intended uh, um, downtype uh, uh, quarks of the standard model. In particular, the, our uh, coupling will be, uh, this mediator will couple only with uh, uh, one of the dark quarks and uh, only with uh, uh, one standard model downtype quarks at a time. So we, can, uh, we will have different models fixing k to one, two, or three for the downstream and bottom. So here I can uh, show what are the constraints. Uh, I'll show the constraints only for the coupling uh, with a strange quark only and the bottom quark only for the simple fact that uh, uh, the coupling with the uh, down quark is uh, completely ruled out. So here we have constraints on the parameter space lambda versus the uh, lightest uh, dark matter mass. So in our case, we have three dark matter particles, so it's multi-component dark matter. We fix the mass of the dark quarks uh, with N2 and N3 to be degenerate, while the mass of N1 to be a bit larger. Uh, one can assume that uh, you have different relative correction with respect to the other two masses. And uh, also, this is done in such a way that the uh, thermal average cross-section is uh, S-wave and not P-wave. And uh, in this case, uh, we will get constraints from indirect detection. So starting at uh, large lambda, uh, we have uh, uh, direct detection constraints. Uh, this is understandable, uh, is the usual uh, uh, direct detection. Uh, constraints are taken from xenon. So as we go down uh, in lambda, at a certain point, we will reach the decay in dark matter regime. So here, in this uh, part of the parameter space, we are in the coupling independent regime. Then we go down, we reach the decay in dark matter regime. In this case, uh, uh, for a fixed lambda, uh, we will have uh, uh, more dark matter, and therefore F, the uh, dark pion decay constant, has to decrease in order to get the correct relic density. So in this plot here, the parameter F is varied in order to get the correct relic density. So once uh, uh, lambda decreases even more, we will get a constraint from direct detection, from the cascade uh, direct detection. Um, 
As you, as you can see, uh, there is uh, some difference between a strange and bottom only for the indirect detection. And this is due simply to the fact that uh, uh, the decay of uh, the unstable uh, dark pions uh, for uh, um, coupling with uh, the lighter uh, quarks are uh, uh, helicity suppressed. And therefore, in this plot here, the codecaying regime starts uh, for larger, larger lambda with respect to this, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, this plot here, for this model here. Uh, there is another difference. So here you can see also the, uh, the contours of uh, m pi over f uh, that show you more or less what is the value of f that uh, you need to obtain the correct relic density. And uh, again, you see that uh, uh, increasing uh, the, the dark matter mass, uh, the value of f, uh, this ratio has to increase. And this is again due to the fact that the, uh, for a fixed uh, uh, F, um, um, the, um, the relic density increases, and therefore you have to decrease uh, the, the value uh, of F uh, in order to get the correct relic density. Uh, for the um, model uh, with the coupling with bottom only, you have also another feature, as you can see here. This is simply due to the fact that uh, uh, when uh, the um, dark sector decouple from the standard model, you have also some uh, energy change effect. And uh, so here you have that uh, uh, once uh, before getting into the codecaying dark matter regime, uh, you will have that the energy exchange is not efficient enough. So F has to increase. So this, uh, uh, this uh, ratio has to uh, has to decrease once we go down. And then we will uh, enter uh, in the codecaying dark matter regime and it will uh, follow and we will get the uh, indirect detection uh, constraint. Here uh, I have the same plot uh, for the same two models, but uh, now the contours uh, decay length of the unstable uh, uh, pion. Uh, this is important mainly for collider searches, because uh, as you can see, uh, we will have that the unstable pion can decay promptly as uh, they can uh, decay inside the detector. And uh, for some of the models that I'm not going to show uh, in this talk, uh, they can even decay outside the detector. And so this one uh, will give rise uh, to uh, prompt decay, will give, it, will give rise to uh, semi-visible jets at collider. Uh, decay inside the detector will give rise to displaced vertices or emerging jets, depending on the multiplicity. And uh, in case uh, you have uh, the decay outside the detector, will give rise simply to uh, missing energy. Now, this model of course, is not uh, probably so realistic. So one can try to uh, make um, the model more real. And uh, we can do so just requiring that there are three generations of uh, uh, mediators. Uh, and each uh, generation of mediator couple with uh, one of the, uh, of the quark. And all the mediators couple with uh, uh, the, uh, the dark quark N1. So this is similar to what happens in supersymmetry, where you have that quarks generally couple more with the quarks of their own generation, although this one uh, doesn't have to be uh, the case. Here I present uh, the same uh, um, the same plot as before, but uh, for this new model. And as you can see now, the direct detection constraints uh, are uh, much larger, and simply due to the fact that uh, you have couplings also with uh, the down and therefore you expect uh, direct detection constraints to be, uh, to be larger. Then uh, uh, everything happens in this plot is more or less the same as before. Another possible uh, um, model is a simple Z prime model. Uh, we chose here a, Z a sequential Z prime. Uh, it means uh, that uh, the coupling uh, with the standard the fermion, uh, the, we, it means simply that the standard model fermion has a, a, a U1 charge that, is, uh, uh, that has the same value as the, as the uh, weak hypercharge of the fermion. Uh, we chose N1 to have charge 1, such that we have that, uh, that Z prime couple only with the uh, quark N1. We have a different ratio between the dark quark masses. And uh, we see again uh, the feature that the um, that the direct detection is uh, pretty strong. And this is due, again, to the fact that uh, now you are coupling uh, both with uh, up and down quarks. And then uh, you have that uh, indirect detection is uh, stronger, uh, where uh, you have that uh, the k 
to top uh, is the kinematically forbidden, and it is uh, uh, weaker when you have the decay of top is uh, uh, allowed. And this is simply because uh, uh, when the top, the decay to top is allowed, the uh, co-decay in dark matter regime will enter uh, for smaller for smaller lambda. Finally, uh, one can try also to understand what are the prospects uh, from future uh, indirect detection uh, constraints. So uh, in this uh, plot, uh, we have uh, uh, on the left the model uh, with the coupling with down quarks, and on the right the model uh, on the, of the Z prime. Uh, and we have these contour lines that are simply uh, what are the future bound if, we, uh, if a future direct detection experiments will get better of a factor. N or uh, 20. And as we can see, the direct detection experiment will, be, uh, will give uh, very strong uh, constraints. Uh, you can ask if uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, increase in the sensitivity uh, are natural. And, uh, I can tell you that, uh, uh, for example, uh, um, one order of magnitude uh, better can be reached simply by Fermilat uh, if uh, new dwarf uh, spheroidals are discovered. And uh, here I get my to my conclusions. Uh, so we studied the uh, hidden valley models uh, with stable and unstable uh, uh, dark pions. We get that uh, uh, we showed constraints from direct detection and indirect detection. And uh, we showed that uh, the parameter space that uh, is allowed is uh, uh, fall in the regime of the, on this uh, coupling independent regime. And then we mapped uh, these uh, models uh, to possible exotic collider signatures and uh, future indirect detection experiments. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Questions? Um, if you have a hidden QCD, you don't actually need hidden quarks because you have glue ball. Why do you have hidden pions rather than hidden glue balls like in a QCD without quarks? Well, I'm sure you can have also, yes, glue balls, but uh, I, mean, I, I think that uh, it's probably better, uh, better in, it's easier to, in this way, to just uh, study the model because you have just a copy of uh, QCD and uh, you know more or less how to treat it. The difference is the difference is that with pions, with multiple flavors, you also have, as you saw, I mean, you have chiral symmetry and you have light states and heavy states. You have an additional hierarchy because of symmetry breaking. Glue balls are heavy by design. There is no symmetry yes, protecting them. Yes, yes, yes. You also have to, for example, we we studied only up to 500 GV for the simple fact that otherwise you have to add uh, other states, uh, other uh, uh, hadron, dark hadrons, and so on. But yeah, global is a possibility too. So the sequential Z prime model you proposed is that UV complete now? I, I didn't propose the sequential Z prime. It's just uh, it's just the Z prime in which you cancel the anomalies. So the the you have U1 charges for your fermion uh, standard model fermions in such a way that you cancel the anomalies. Oh, okay. Is you I could have used any any other Z prime and just say that it's not complete and uh, there is new physics uh, tire scale that cancel the anomalies and. So uh, just for uh, clarification, I think I'm sure you, you said. But uh, so, uh, can you remind me what is the, the portal between this uh, hidden sector and the standard model? So in, in in the Z prime is model is the Z prime, and in this is uh, this uh, scalar here. And uh, when we set all the bounds, so, so, sorry, the, the, just so that the capital D standard model down quark or. Uh, this one is the standard model uh, down type quarks. Okay, so, so the X carries a uh, color, our color. D are our quarks. Yep. N are the dark quarks, and X are the. Uh, so this X is uh, by fundamental of the two SU3s. So. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, to, to get the constraints, we just integrate out because uh, collider requires to be larger than 1 TV, and so you get uh, basically the Lagrangian. You get these uh, these terms here in the Lagrangian where you have. And, and so you were putting also constraints on this X or uh, 
Uh, no, this X is fixed to one TV for the simple fact that uh, in the previous work uh, that we used the more or less the same models, we found that uh, the bounds were, uh, let's say, below one TV. So we put one TV to be to be safe. And in the Z prime model, uh, the Z prime is at three TV because the bounds now are at three TV. But uh, it, it doesn't matter because you can just uh, scale. Uh, you can escape bounds quite easily. Some other question? So just a very broad question, probably. Um, which would be the when you do this kind of uh, extension of the standard model to introduce dark matter particles, kind of thinking in mirroring the standard model that you know, yeah. uh, to me, uh, probably it's a criticism, but to me, it's, uh, which is, would be the guide or the motivation to know which sector you want to mirror? Uh, because one would should one would should do is starting from the very minimal hypothesis to introduce the very minimal particles. Yes, yes. And but then when if you start to mirror, you can do more or less everything. So sure. Which is the, the so where when, you start? Where are when the, uh, when you do the minimal uh, things, usually you get you end up here or here or here or here or here. So you are excluded. So what you try to use, you try to use some other possible guidelines that uh, are, for example, uh, the fact that you want to solve other problems. You might think that the hierarchy problem is not, uh, is not really a problem, fair enough. Uh, but there are several models, like Twinx, Relaxion, that uh, solves uh, this problem and uh, are the guideline for these kind of models. Or you might think from a more experimental point of view, you might think that there are exotic signatures that you might see uh, at uh, colliders but you don't know if there are models, possible models that... Of course, it is not experimental-driven, but I would say that uh, there is no dark matter model that is really experimental-driven right now because there is no dark matter particle. So, yeah. Something else? Very quick. Okay, very good. So let's thank Giovanni again. Thank you. So we now have the coffee break. We reconvene uh, at 3.40. And uh, the speakers of the next session who still didn't give me the presentation, please come here that I will put it on the laptop. <laughs>